welcome to today's edition of Life in the Law, and I'm your host, Carol Mon Lee. Our guest today is Justine Herrera, uh, a lawyer and graduate of the William S. Richardson School of Law and the new executive director of MaxCorp, Maximum Legal Services Corporation, a very important nonprofit legal organization that provides trustee, conservatorship, and other services for people who need help managing their finances or properties. It serves people around the entire state who are not otherwise able to obtain those services elsewhere. So welcome, Justine. Thanks so much for having me, Carol. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. So MaxCorp, which yes. the full name is Maximum Legal Services Corporation. So tell us a little bit about MaxCorp and uh, its mission. Well, MaxCorp um, was started in 1988. So we've been around for quite a bit of time. And we were originally founded from the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii. So we are a nonprofit corporation. And the idea behind starting MaxCorp was that at the time, Legal Aid was coming under some strains for funding, um, similar to where we are now, where the federal government is looking to cut back on some legal service fundings. MaxCorp was founded around that same period of time, and it was because the Legal Aid Board of Directors really saw the need for guardianships of the property for disabled adults and children that wasn't necessarily going to be funded by grants. So they started Maximum Legal Services Corporation as a way to fill that need for what we call the gap group individuals, people that may not qualify for legal services, but may actually qualify um, for additional services, but, but not necessarily funded by grants. So MaxCorp was started and we eventually became our own independent nonprofit. So you're no longer affiliated with Legal Aid? That is correct. Mm -hmm. We're no longer affiliated with Legal Aid, but we have a lot of the same um, board of directors that we that actually initially started um, MaxCorp still on our board today. So give me the background of the name Max. Is it Maximum? Maximum Services? Maximum? Maximum was actually started because one of the founding attorneys from Legal Aid on Kauai, his name is Max Graham. <laughs> so it was kind of a play Max on Graham. words. <laughs> so you oh, know funny. Max, yeah. yes. So it was a kind of a play on words and he was one of the uh, founders and they decided to have a little fun with the name and so they came up with Maximum Legal Services Corporation. I see. So okay, so I see you were specifically uh, then established to service only certain types of cases. Well, originally when we were founded, the idea was behind it was really servicing disabled people who may need help managing their finances. Okay, but, so give me an example. So an example of that, um, the typical case is going to be an individual who may have been involved in an accident. And through that accident, they've lost capacity to manage their finances and funding. And a lot of the times you're getting money from a settlement because of the accident. Mm -hmm. and the attorney, insurance. insurance, whatever that case may be. And so a lot of the times you're setting up a special needs trust for the individual so that their money can be used for their benefit. But oftentimes if there were adults or minor children, there wasn't anyone to actually serve as trustee. And so MaxCorp came into existence to actually be that trustee to manage the finances, making sure that we were able to pay the bills, um, a lot of the times with a special needs trust, you can't pay for all the things that you could want. It's there so that the person, individual can still get benefits um, like Medicaid and Medicare, Social Security benefits, while receiving some supplemental income to kind of uh, keep them above poverty line since they have that funding available to them. So will Maximum, so MaxCorp actually maintains these accounts for individuals? Will it open up an account at a bank or some other financial institution, pool all of the resources for that individual, and then distribute and pay bills? Correct. Uh -huh. A lot of what we are is a fiduciary service. Nice. So we are opening accounts, reconciling bank accounts, um, paying bills, and then the additional level to that is we have myself, an attorney on staff, that we can actually, if it's court ordered, file petitions with court, accountings with court, and report back to court um, so that they know exactly what we're doing and that we're, um, you know, confining to the law in that regard. Mm -hmm. So um, how many attorneys do you have on staff? Well, right now we just have me. I'm the solo <laughs> attorney as well as the executive director, so I wear lots of different hats. Um, but we also have a paralegal that helps me. And, and as you know, paralegals are always the crux to a legal practice. So we have a fantastic paralegal um, office assistant. And then in addition to our legal team, we actually also have two bookkeepers on staff that help manage the client's finances, making sure that bank and 
bank accounts are reconciled monthly so that we know exactly what's going in and what's coming out of each bank account so we can make um, financial decisions based on accurate accounting. And then in addition, what, what makes MaxCorp really unique is that we've had this social worker aspect, um, which allows us to add a different level of service for our clients. That social worker helps the clients by setting budgets with them and also connecting them with different social services, making sure that they're really getting the full benefit, um, whether that's connecting them with Social Security Office, with the VA to get certain other benefits that may be available to them. Um, so we're really kind of a, we like to call ourselves kind of a one-stop shop mm. in terms of fiduciary services, where we're not only covering the legal side, but we've got the bookkeeping and accounting side as well as the social side. About how many um, clients do you have at any given time? Well, right now we have a client base of about 60 clients. Mm -hmm. um, so we're still growing, and there's always room to grow. <laughs> are they all from Oahu, or do you also accept clients from neighbor islands? We are all over the neighbor islands. So we have cases on Big Island, on Maui. Majority of our cases are in Oahu. Um, and I don't know if we have any current active cases on Kauai, uh, but we do have a presence on all islands. Mm. You know, I know we have a great slide on the summary of the services in the team. Zuri, can we show that one? So let's see, you've mentioned the conservatorship administration mm -hmm. and trust administration, special needs trust administration. What is that? So the special needs trust and the supplemental needs trust are different types of trust that be, can be created. And these trusts have higher restrictions on them as to how you can spend the funds. And a lot of so them So an have, example of a person who might need that? So that's typically an individual. And we have a, a lot of cases where um, there can either be a first party or third party trust. Mm -hmm. and and the first party trust is that example of someone who may be in a car accident right. um, where the funds are given to them directly and they're able to because so they, they have the funds. they have an accident and someone's insurance pays them a million dollars yes to so, cover part of their injury mm -hmm. and other now if they may already be receiving some benefits maybe they want to keep their SSI mm -hmm. they can't receive the full amount to themselves it'll automatically disqualify them from certain services right so you put it in a special needs trust and that allows them to still have that fund available to them without disqualifying them from certain um, federal funding services that they may need so it's Theirs technically, but they don't have access to it as easily yes. uh, without that trust. So therefore, will not disqualify them. Correct. From, uh, and those trusts also have an automatic um, payback provision that says after they pass, the uh, money left over will go back to pay back Medicaid. So any excess funds that they don't spend will, can be used to pay back the state for any medical services that went uh, covered. I see. And then I noticed the last uh, service was probate, um, probate administration. Yeah, so that's so actually that. one of our newer services that uh -huh. we just started doing um, in 2016. And it came about because a lot of our conservatorship cases, um, they typically end when an individual passes away. But what do we do when there's still funding left over? So for our audience, what, what is a conservatorship? Good question. So a conservatorship is when an individual loses capacity to manage their finances and they don't have a power of attorney in place. Typically, you have to go to court and request... So this might be someone who has um, become incapacity because of uh, an accident or, or dementia, Alzheimer's. The, you know, that I think typically what we're seeing nowadays, um, because as a society we're living longer, you know, a lot of these issues facing us when we age, like losing your mental ability to be able to keep up with your finances, pay your bills, get your taxes done on time, all those things, if they go undone, someone can look and say, hey, you may need a conservatorship to have someone help you manage those finances. So a lot of the time it's family members or um, other individuals like care homes who may see that a person is not being you know, able to manage their own finances. And they may ask an attorney to come and petition the court to get a conservatorship over an individual. So this might be an adult child Correct. or a friend of the family. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. And you step in 
if there are no children or well we step in if there's no one that's willing to become the conservator and with being appointed as a conservator by the court you have some responsibilities that maybe your regular person wouldn't want to handle right and that would be like you have to report back to the court annually as to your expenses and you need to provide budgets to the court for future expenses so actually any conservator would have to provide that except they may not be equipped or want to do that so okay. you can step in and do that I mean it's challenging enough to manage your own checkbook imagine having to manage somebody else's and be able to keep your accounting in line to present it to the court annually uh, so so it is a challenge that most you know regular family members maybe they're busy taking care of the actual individual, the sure, day-to-day day -to -day care. Day needs. Yeah, and they may not have time to go about and to actually do all the financial steps, make sure all the bills are paid, make sure everything's done timely, um, and then again, put it all together in a report to the court at the end of the year. So we can provide that services to families who either don't have anyone necessarily to serve, and that could be maybe the elderly couple who hasn't had any kids, right. or it's the family that maybe only has one or two kids that maybe are on the mainland or are already handling their everyday care and don't have the energy and time to really spend it on the financial side. Okay, and so then when that person dies, the, do we call that person the patient? Or well, the, well, our client. We typically client, says right. our client when they pass. Um, if they have funds left over, we've come into the issue of what do we do? You know, we've been conservator, and your conservatorship ends at the term of somebody's life. So the next step is typically you have the will probated at court. Now what happens if they don't have a will or if the person they list in the will was never asked in the first place and are not willing to do so? So MaxCorp has offered um, those clients that we would step in and we can be the personal representative named in the will and we will actually go through the steps to make sure that the will is properly probated. Notice is provided to the public through publication in a newspaper. Um, notice to creditors are, are made. And then after any excess bills that need to be paid, we go ahead and we distribute to the beneficiaries, either listed in the will or via intestate succession. So and I bet it takes a long time. How long does that take? It the does. Probate it process? does. The probate process can take up to six months at minimum and um, typically can last over a year. Wow. So how, how do um, your services get supported or paid for? Well, we are a fee-for-service nonprofit, and that means that we charge fees for our service. Now, we also stick by our mission, and I don't know if we can pull the mission yeah, up on the screen. Yeah, we can look at our mission again. But our, our mission is to provide high-quality legal services and assistance to all persons of all ages who would not be otherwise able to obtain or afford adequate legal representation. So although we are a fee-for-service nonprofit and we do have to accept cases with fees, we do first and foremost when we're looking at whether or not we're going to take a case is does it fit within our mission? Is this an individual who would not be able to receive services elsewhere? And elsewhere, when we talk about elsewhere, we're usually talking about corporate trustees. And that's typically the banks, the larger banks institutions, and they have certain thresholds for amount of liquid assets that a person needs to have in order minimums. for... And minimums. And minimums, right. exactly. And so a lot of the times when we're looking at a case as to whether we should accept it or not is really is there anywhere else for this person to go? Right. And so we that's, you know, for me, the first checklist that we need to ask ourselves. And then comes secondary, whether or not they, you know, can, pay. they can pay. Right. And if they can only provide a limited amount, then we work that out. Um, we don't want to turn anyone away because, you know, like I said, our mission is first and foremost, and that's really where we want to be able to serve the public. That's why Max Corp was set up. Um, and so we try to do it in a fiscally responsible way, but at the same time, um, recognizing the need in the community for the service. Great. Okay, well, we're going to take a short break, Justine, and come right back and hear more about Max Maximum Legal Services Corps, and it's very important work in our community. We'll be right back. Hello, thank you for watching Think Tech Planet of the Courageous. I'm Dr. Dean Nelson, host of Planet of the Courageous. In Tibetan mythology, it's said that you pick this planet to learn something. You picked your birth on this planet to learn something. This planet is spinning and hurling through space at 67,000 miles per hour, and it takes courage to not slip into fear and collapse into anxiety. One can find so many justifications for selfishness 
bias and prejudice. But we have two ears to listen to one another and one heart that can provide a common ground. But this takes courage to stay in that space. We've chosen the right planet for the opportunity to learn courage and try to solve so many challenges. Aloha. Thank you for watching. We're back. This is Carol Mon Lee, and my guest today is Justine Herrera, the uh, sole lawyer and executive director of Maximum Legal Earth Services Corps. So thank you so much, Justine, for being here. So we were talking a bit about the types of um, support that you provide to your clients, and uh, although you're fee-for-services, you do have pro bono clients. So what percentage of your clients are pro bono, and what percentage actually pay for services? Well. We right now have a nice even mix of both pro bono and fee-for-service clients. So I would say uh, we're about 50% even on both. And like I said, it's it's right in line with our mission that, you know, although the fees are important, it's more important to serve those in need. So even though some may be pro bono, some may be very reduced fee um, for individuals who, uh, you know, an example would be uh, we have a client who is was involved in an accident and only receives Social Security. So we all know that's not enough to live off of, especially because he's dependent on 24-hour care oh no and so so this but the accident didn't result in any insurance payout it or didn't any unfortunately lawsuit or nothing no all. no it was um, just kind of one of those freak medical accidents that happened to individuals and um, I believe he suffered several strokes um, throughout that and, and made his condition a little bit you know continue to deteriorate so we only receive a certain limited amount of funding every month for the individual, but we want to make sure that money goes well, towards his care. So you mean you receive it on his behalf? Correct. From yes. uh, from Social Security. Social Security. And does he have family that he doesn't? Unfortunately, he has no family. So, so you step in. We've stepped in, and um, we make sure that his caregiver is paid for first and foremost. Secondarily, that that's he all the bookkeeping. That's, that's the bookkeeping, right. and then you know he's a human being as well. So we want to make sure that he has spending allowance as much as permissible. We give them um, some money to spend on you know the things that we all like. Just because he's disabled and at home doesn't mean he doesn't have access to Amazon or internet. So why not give individuals some integrity, some autonomy in that? So it sounds like because you mentioned you have social uh, workers uh, on board and as well as people who help with the budget and the bookkeeping. Um, so does your social worker actually go to your client's home and oh yeah our social worker actually does home visits which is like I said what really makes us unique is that aspect um, in fact just last week she did a home visit to um, one of our clients uh, who's actually a couple a married couple uh, both are disabled and um, was able to go and just do a home visit see how everything's going they had some wishes and wants on their list so we went there to see if we can make those things a reality. Purchasing certain things, exactly. services. Exactly, yeah, washer and dryer, those type of things. And seeing if, you know, A, is the house equipped for it, and asking those questions to the resident manager and things like that, whether or not the apartment can be retrofitted to include certain amenities that they're requesting, and what are our options? So we wouldn't be able to know those things if we didn't go down there and actually see how they're living and, you know, what what they need. Um, so does the social worker actually go and do the shopping if they're not able to get in? We try to get them some level of independence, um, but a lot of what our social worker will do is on top of the home visits and setting the budget is looking for different programs that may suit the individual and then working with the guardian if there is one or the individual directly to get them enrolled in different programs, whether it's adult daycare for individuals with dementia and Alzheimer's, getting their caregiver a break and dealing with those issues. Because if you have a 24-hour caregiver and your client has you know, uh, dementia going on Alzheimer's, it can be a lot for one person as a caregiver to deal with 24 hours a day. So being able to find different sources of funding or different programs that we can spend the finances on to get them into, that gives the caregiver a break, and that allows the individual to get a different, you know, group of friends, get out there and, and continue to exercise their mind as best they possibly can. Mm -hmm. So. Um, our social worker provides a great, tremendous service, and it's all catered towards each client. 
because we have such a different variety of clients from children um, who need guardianship or guardianship of the property services to you have your elderly and disabled clients. So having that wide variety really means that our social work has to wear a lot of different hats. You know, what client are we dealing with? And what role are we fitting? Are we the conservator? Are we the trustee? You know, are we dealing with family members? Are we the PR um, probating someone's will and helping, you know, with different um, aspects of grief? Boy, I, I didn't realize how complex uh, the services that you provide um, your clients. So how do these clients find you? Well, we were very fortunate to have good connections with attorneys in the community. Um, since we've been around for so long, we get a lot of referrals from attorneys who are in the process of drafting the document and maybe what they, kind of document they're drafting the trust or, or the conservatorship. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been approached by a family member to initiate a conservatorship or by the individual to do a trust. And the question becomes, so who are you naming? And if the answer is, well, I'm not too sure or I don't have anybody, you and know, I can't afford to pay a corporate trustee. trustee. Exactly. So then we uh, rely a lot on referrals from local attorneys in the community. Um, for a while, we had a very good connection with the Maui Office of Public Guardian. Um, we know that the public guardians' offices around the state are uh, have a high load of cases. <laughs> And so we, we try to connect with them to let them know that if they see cases where we can become a partner, um, we'd be happy to, to step in and become involved. Is there a wait list? For our, for our services, no, not right now. We don't have a wait list, um, so we are accepting new cases. Uh, so if there's any attorneys out there. <laughs> Very good. We will uh, post in uh, toward the end of the show some contact information so you all know where to find uh, Justine and Max Lee, uh, Max Core, Max Core. <laughs> Great. So tell me a little bit about, um, you mentioned your, your fee for services. Mm -hmm. Do you have and you're but you're a nonprofit. Do you mm -hmm. accept donations? We do. We do absolutely <laughs> accept donations. Um, so we've been a fee for service program for quite a long time. When we first started, we did um, have some grants through the Hawaii um, Foundation, the Justice Foundation. Um, so, but because we know that grants aren't necessarily sustainable, and there's other nonprofits out there that also need grants as well. Um, we try to be independent as much as possible, um, but we always will accept donations from um, the community who see what we do as an important aspect. Um, but we also really enjoy referrals from attorneys who have cases that we could be of assistance. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a minimum threshold, so we can accept all types of cases. Um, so we're a corporate trustee. Um, we might have a minimum million dollar account, you have no such limitation. We have no such limitation. In fact, recently we accepted a case where um, it was a probate issue where an individual passed and he left some funds for his grandchildren. Now they're all minor kids so they can't necessarily just receive it outright. Uh, I think their ages ranged between 10 and 17, so a wide variety of grandkids. Uh, we were asked by the court to step in to administer their funds, and it was a small amount left for them, but enough to have a nice gift for them when they turn 18. So until they turn 18, you establish bank accounts mm -hmm. and distribute on a regular basis. Um, if they need money, they come to you and ask for money? Correct. So we allow them to know where our funds are kept, um, give reportings to them on an annual basis. Uh, depending on what the court requires, we may have to report to the court either annually or triannually. And then, you know, we provide a way so that they can, you know, get their funds when they need it and the court knows that it's being responsibly held and it's not being um, spent <laughs> too quickly and that hopefully we'll have enough saved so that when they do turn 18, if they want, we can turn over the account to them, they can invest the money, they can spend the money, they can use it to college, you know, whatever they want, um, it'll become theirs, but we'll be safekeeping it in the meantime to make sure that they have something when they turn 18. Uh, that's a really important um, method for them to be able to access their money but have it safe in the meantime being Correct. watched and, and um, protected and hopefully growing if that's what you do you invest the money we do we oftentimes do in fact we have another case where a minor um, uh, parent passed away and left a life insurance settlement which is you know a, a great way to provide for our children's future in case of an accident and um, 
you know, what do you do when you're a young kid? Now you all of a sudden have a large sum. So uh, she was old enough that we were able to go to the financial planner together and include her in the decision making. So she could learn about. So she can learn about finances and exactly and make smart decisions for when she is of age and ready to take over that she can either continue to invest and maybe have enough to buy a home eventually one day, or use it for college and and you know enjoy a loan free college experience so you know there's a lot of ways that we help the community whether they're young elderly disabled i mean such a variety different of avenues that we can really uh, provide services to people who, who really don't have a lot of options mm -hmm. elsewhere in the community right. so what's the future of max core well i see us growing um, this is the first time in max corp's history that we've had an executive director and an attorney full-time so i've taken on that role and i'm here looking to expand um, i've been talking to a lot of attorneys since I first started here to find out what other needs can we fill in the community um, and and what what do they need um, in terms of attorneys who are drafting the documents and how else can we serve you know the people of Hawaii so I'm starting to get a lot of different inputs from a lot of different attorneys on how we can continue to grow what services are needed and um, I don't know if we mentioned that I'm in my third month at Max no, Corp. No, we said you knew, <laughs> new executive so, director. So as I get more familiar with um, what the needs are in the community, I hope to expand our services um, and be able to offer a different variety of services and places that people may need. Um, and so we'll see where the future takes us, but I have high hopes for Max Corp. Okay, great. And just quickly, do you see any changes in the future because of the changes in the political environment or um, the possible increase in immigrant issues? You know, I, I do. Um, and working in the legal service field has been something that I've dedicated my my very short career as being an attorney, but um, my career is in, in the legal field towards. And I know that Although it won't directly affect our budget, it will affect that of Legal Aid Society of Hawaii and, and the other organizations that receive federal funding. And because of that, I think that they're not going to be able to serve as many people, um, which is the unfortunate reality of, of getting right. funding cut, which means that we may have to fulfill a need. Pick, pick up some of that. Exactly. So once that happens, and it's too early to tell exactly what's going to happen um, with the new administration, but once we figure that out and we find out what services have been cut, where is the need, uh, we may look into picking up that slack and seeing what we can do to well, we'll, do our part. We'll be watching you, Justine. That's <laughs> a wonderful potential help to our society, our community. We just have a few seconds. Um, do you have something you'd like to say to our community? And uh, we're flashing on the screen the contact information for MaxCorp. Uh, there's the website, www.maxlegalservices.org, and the phone number, 808-585-0920. And Justine? What would you like to say? Well, I would like to tell everyone listening and watching today, if you haven't heard of MaxCorp, please go to our website, take a look, find out a little bit more about our services that we provide. If you're an attorney who has maybe a client in mind that could benefit from our services, please do give us a call. Um, and then if there's any clients out there or potential clients out there who are watching and who are interested in how Max services can help you, please call, um, go visit our website, and... Um, Contact us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justine. We really appreciated learning more about MaxCore. And uh, this is Carol Monley for Think Tech Hawaii Life and the Law. We'll see you next time. Hello.